Texas Lutheran University. Sarah Bonds here this evening to share some time with us, uh, but a little bit of background information for you. Uh, Sarah founded Circle of Health International in 2004 as a way to help women uh, get reproductive, maternal, and newborn health care in areas affected by disasters and war. Sarah is a social justice grassroots activist committed to working towards balancing the scales of access, equity, and availability in women's reproductive health care. She has training in midwifery, a Bachelor of Arts degree in Women's Studies, and a Master's degree in Public Health. Her community organizing background ranges from reproductive rights to violence against women, to welfare and poverty issues, to anti-war campaigns. She has worked on women's health issues with teenage and minority mothers in rural areas across the western part of the United States, with refugee communities in Boston, Massachusetts, and with midwives in northern India, Guatemala, Tibet, Palestine, Tsunami affected Sri Lanka, Sudan, Tanzania, Jordan, Haiti, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Turkey. Sorry, that's really obnoxious. I need to like that? tone that down. No, as a geographer, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the list doesn't stop there. <laughs> just gonna hide behind my stuff. Yeah, I know. This is, I know. <laughs> but this is the power of what you do, though, Sarah. Uh, your work has taken with commercial sex workers in, in issues of HIV and AIDS in Vietnam. Uh, with female evacuees from even here at home with uh, Hurricanes Rita and Katrina. Uh, working with survivors of natural disasters and the tornadoes in Oklahoma, and I think one of those images you saw that there. Uh, <coughs> and also working to stop human trafficking in Central Texas. Uh, and most recently working with refugees that have been arriving uh, in the Rio Grande Valley here in, in South Texas, and, I'm a, and I will say I got to spend one day with her down at the clinic and watch her at work. Uh, Coe's work has been featured in uh, places like Huffington Post, MSNBC, and local TV stations. She's been honored by Boston University with the 2013 Young Alumni Award, and most recently, this is just amazing, uh, Sarah and Cohey was honored with the Social Enterprise Fellowship from, I guess that's Unlimited USA? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is an organization that only selects a very small group, and Sarah and Cohey was just one of five to be honored with this distinction just recently. I am delighted, and we are very lucky that she squeezed a few hours out of her busy schedule <laughs> to spend some time with us. So please, without further ado, let us welcome Sarah Bonds. Wow, that was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, hi. That was embarrassing a little bit. Um, so, international development, right? That's where we are. Some nursing students, I hear, maybe, a couple, no? Look, yeah, yeah, there's students that are not from international development, raise your hand. Where are you from, folks? And you are from social entrepreneurship? Ah, oh, sweet. Okay, great. So I can kind of frame the talking around those things. So I don't want to just stand up here and talk at you for an hour. That's not fun. I'd rather talk and listen and talk and listen. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, and then if nobody jumps up with some questions, I'm going to ask some questions. And hopefully, we'll roll along that way. Um, I want this to be of use to you guys. I remember a long, long time ago when I was sitting where you are sitting at the University of Montana, which is where I went to college in Missoula, um, and the international development professor arrived. Like, we didn't have one. And then she arrived from Kathmandu, and we were like, ah, oh, oh, you're so cool. And uh, yeah, it blew our little minds, um, what the amazing work that she was doing there. And having access to people who do the stuff that you want to go out there in the world to do is super useful so that you can ask real questions about what this life looks like. Um, and I will give you honest answers about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the organization and our work and how we do it and why we do it and where we do it. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the social entrepreneurship work that we have, um, that has sort of emerged for us in the last 12 months. Um, and then we'll talk. Does that sound good? All right, so 
I founded this organization in 2004. Um, I founded the organization right out of graduate school. I got my MPH, my Master's in Public Health at Boston University, where I focused my studies on complex humanitarian emergency management. What does that mean? It means setting up refugee camps and taking assessments for cholera outbreaks um, and how to set, uh, how to conduct surveys in places where people are migratory populations and people are moving and how to make sure you're getting the right sample populations. Um, and my lens for all of that was reproductive health and keeping women in mind and how to do this work um, with that lens of women's health and feminism, which are two of the tenets that the organization is based on. So I had the experience of working for UNICEF, this big sort of monolithic organization. I ran a midwifery training program in rural India. Um, lots of pros and cons with that experience. Um, and then I had the experience of working for a teeny tiny little mom and pop NGO in Guatemala. Lots of pros and cons with that experience. Um, to summarize, what was hard about UNICEF was that there wasn't a lot of cultural appropriateness. It was this big organization based in Midtown Manhattan that had nutrition programs and HIV programs, but they didn't necessarily um, fit the folks that we were working with in different parts of the world. For example, when I received the educational materials for the HIV module that I was supposed to lead to this 250 rural Indian midwives who couldn't write their names, the pictures, so it was this like big flip chart, and everybody in the flip chart was white, and they were eating hamburgers. They don't eat cows in India. Didn't translate very well. Um, but the, the, the thing that really got me was the pictures about the like three different photos in consecutive order about how HIV was transmitted. And this will stay with me forever. So like the first picture when you get to the, like this is how HIV happens. There's this dude in like a button down shirt and some jeans and he's sitting on a curb, right? And he's just sitting and like back, ominous, in the back of the picture is this like zombie coming out, and that's AIDS, right? AIDS zombie. <laughs> so like the next picture, <laughs> you flip it over, and the zombie is choking the guy on the curb, right? And then the final picture was like the guy all laid out on the ground, and the zombie being like all superior, <laughs> having, having now like gotten the zombie HIV-ness on the guy on the ground. So not, <laughs> not very scientifically sound, um, but also really spoke to how it wasn't, it wasn't the organization's um, intention to communicate this like, respect that we do a lot at COE, at Circle of Health International, for the people in the room. Like those midwives know as much as I do, if not more. All I happen to know is a little bit of science about this virus. So let me help you understand a little bit about how this is transmitted, and then you can teach me how you've managed to keep these babies alive forever with no resources, and we can share that information. So it was that kind of experience at UNICEF that I was like, oh, that's right, but not quite right. And then the tiny little NGO that I worked with in Guatemala did just amazing community-based work. Like They really knew the communities they worked in. They knew those people really intimately. They spoke um, Quiche, this indigenous language in Guatemala. They really understood it, but their funding was super insecure. And it was really just this husband and wife team from upstate New York who had decided to do this. So they were back and forth all the time. And they didn't have time to build the infrastructure of the organization. They didn't have time to interact with the other people in the country doing similar work so that they could be part of this bigger network. So in that, um, in graduate school, me and this group of crazy, ego-ridden rebels, we decided that we were just going to start this other organization. It was going to, our goal is to chart sort of a middle way, a middle path in international development. Um, and so we really believe that the mid-sized organization serves a role. There's so much power in community-based work. There is also so many resources in the multinational organizations that often don't find their way to the people on the community-based level who really need them. And there was just this big gap. They weren't talking to each other. So we started our organization with the intention of serving as sort of that conduit through which that information and those relationships flowed. 
And then we targeted midwives as our partners because we know that 80% of the world's refugees are women and children, actually higher now and since 2004 than when we started the organization. Um, however, the very specific reproductive health needs of women are not often considered when organizing in a humanitarian response. For example, um, water, food, and shelter, top three priorities always, right? That makes sense. Um, but when 80% of your population is either menstruating, pregnant, or nursing, you should probably make sure you've got like some pads and some diapers and maybe some baby formula you're setting up your safe spaces for women and it's culturally appropriate for them to take care of themselves and often that's not the case. So that's one of the, surprisingly, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is, hey, do you have maxi pads in your kits that you're sending out? Hey, where are the safe places for women to go nurse? Hey, if a woman's been assaulted in your bathroom in this camp, where can she go to get a rape kit or to get emergency contraception afterwards? So those are the kinds of things that we, we do. And we do that through our community-based partnerships. Um, so we've worked in 18 different humanitarian emergencies, long list, as you heard. Um, kind of embarrassing. I need to figure out how to condense that a little bit. Um, right now, we are really, really active and engaged and focused on the refugee crisis in Europe. That's taking up a lot of our bandwidth. Um, so we've been working with the Syrian diaspora since 2012. We've worked inside of Syria. We've also worked in Jordan and Lebanon um, and Turkey, and now Greece. Um, and we just, like two days ago, drove a mobile clinic from the Netherlands down to Greece, and we're, we're outfitting this sort of caravan of mobile health units because the crisis is moving a lot, it isn't static, it isn't, stasis, it isn't staying in one place, so we want to be able to be flexible in that regard. Um, we also work with a local indigenous group in Nicaragua. We help to host a women's forum every fall that has a thousand indigenous leaders, women <laughs> leaders from around the country, and they gather for a week and they talk about land rights and voting and water rights, and each village sends a midwife, so we've got about 90 midwives at this gathering, and we take them off and train them on different things. This last year, we brought blood pressure cuffs, because they'd never had blood pressure cuffs, so we did this amazing three-day training with blood pressure cuffs, which was pretty fun. Um, we've been working in Haiti since 2010, since the earthquake there. Um, we helped to construct a maternity clinic um, that's on the Dominican border. Um, so things were going along pretty steady with that. We built the clinic. We found some incredible Haitian midwives to staff it who'd been there for a couple of years. And then the migrant crisis broke out last summer in the Dominican. And there was this mass exodus of Dominican refugees. And we were the first clinic on the border. So it was not so quiet there last <laughs> summer. We had tens of thousands of people through there as that was happening. Um, we have been working in Nepal for almost a year now. The earthquake in Nepal happened last April. Um, and we've just done tremendous stuff there, not because we're awesome, but because our community partners are amazing. And we just got so lucky with the people we've been working with there. So we, um, we, got, right, we got access to the women's prison. We we're the only NGO that they led into the women's prison in Kathmandu. You do not want to be in a women's prison in Kathmandu, let me tell you that. Do not break the law in Nepal, people. That is not a place you want to be. It's bad. It's really bad when the building crumbles in on you and um, you've, got, you've got nothing. So often women in Nepal are jailed for things like having an abortion or getting raped. Um, these are not like hard criminals. Um, so their children go with them also because they don't have a place to put them. So there were three there were 100 women and 300 children that we were caring for in this prison, and we were the only folks there. So that was a tremendous thing to be able to be a part of. Um, and then we also got um, invited into this incredibly cool sexual ed thing that was had this really grassroots-led movement around um, sex ed, um, around menstruation really was one of the big ones. There's a huge taboo in Nepal around menstruation. Um, when little girls, when they start their period, they're not allowed to go to school anymore. When they have their period, they have to go hang out with the animals. There's like a separate place where they go oftentimes. Um, so 
we did a lot of education around that, and that was really great. Um, we also helped to rebuild, if I remember, the most recent number, I think, was about 250 homes for female-headed households that were at risk um, of additional exploitation because there were no men in those households. So we've been doing that in Nepal. Um, we helped to found a clinic in Austin for survivors of human trafficking which we didn't mean to get into human trafficking, but because of the populations where we work, we have now been doing human trafficking work because it has, it's, we have started to talk about it and recognize that this is something that's real and it's happening in a lot of places, including right here at home. Um, two summers ago, you guys may or may not have heard about an exodus of unaccompanied children coming up from Latin America, coming through the Texas border. So we went down to this border town called McAllen, cool place, um, great food, um, and started to poke around to see if there was really a need, who was there responding to this exodus of young kids, and found out that um, there was a lot of need, actually, it's a significant lack of coordination, which from like the international development point of things, like all of our domestic responses have been so much harder because we don't really have a system for coordination domestically, like the UN offers internationally, so domestically is kind of a mess. Um, so we've been working with Catholic Charities um, out of the Sacred Heart Church, which is just this church, like on the city square in McAllen, in literally a closet, a very glamorized closet clinic in the back of the clinic, or back of the church, um, where some days we see up to 100 people. Um, and this has been going on now for almost two years. And it was supposed to be just sort of this wave that was going to stop, and it hasn't stopped. So we've just realized this is the new normal, and we need to figure out how to organize and support this population. So our team's actually headed back down tomorrow. Um, we're really trying to figure out how to support this in the long term because this is not probably going to stop anytime soon so we just need to we need to be stronger in our responses that we've got going there um so then we had been in conversation with our partners in haiti and our partners in paul in nepal for a couple months about you know the health work that we do is wonderful right like it, it saves lives literally um, we've been doing it for a long time, we've gotten good at it, we're good at the pieces of it that we do. But the underbelly of all of this, of the displacement, of the war, of the climate change, of all of it, is poverty, right? Like poverty is the root of all of it. So the Band-Aids that we put on are great. The birth kits that we deliver that help that one delivery to be safer are great. The solar suitcases that we set up in clinics that have light until the solar, so solar suitcase breaks. You know, all of that is good for the time that it goes on, but poverty is the thing. So what can we do to really be addressing that? And through that was born our social enterprise um, initiative that started five months ago. Um, so we were selected to participate in a social entrepreneurship fellowship for a year and holy smokes, am I learning a lot about that. Um, it's essentially I got a crash course MBA in social impact investing in the last three months. I have a whole new vocabulary about this work. Um, and it's, it's really fabulous. It's, really, it's, it's a totally different spin on international development work. And what I feel like it's equipping us to do is to rather be like, hey, I need your $60. Hey, like I need that $10,000 grant. What it does is that it, it, we can pivot from that. We're still going to have to do a fair amount of that. But in turn, we can be offering things rather than having to go to people with our hand out all the time, which I'm a pretty, I have no pride about that, asking people for money anymore. And it's getting old even for me. So it's time for us to, to find at least another way to accompany the ongoing fundraising that we have to do all the time. And so we are developing a line of products, which is crazy to me still when I say that out loud. Um, so we're starting with cloth diapers. 
Um, and from that, we're hoping to expand into baby slings, like baby carriers. Um, the intention is that the products will be linked to the mission, so they'll be maternal, reproductive, or newborn health-related products. They'll be produced by the women that we care for. So, for example, um, the intention when we started this initiative was that the first, first round of cloth diapers were going to be produced in Nepal by this group of 16 survivors of human trafficking who've already been trained as seamstresses. So they work out of their homes, they've got sewing machines, they've already have other, they've been trained in sort of like a level of quality control and production of expectations with their American um, contractors to produce <coughs> items at a certain level. They would produce the diapers. We will sell them on Etsy and Instagram and in bougie boutiques in Brooklyn and LA and the funds return to support the programming and to deepen the work. So it's not like a microfinance situation. These are not loans that are going out to the women that we serve. We are hiring the women to work as contractors for us. They produce a product. We are the seller of the product. And then the profits return to expand the programming that we do, the health programming that we do in those communities. So learning a whole lot about how hard that is and um, boy, did we think that was not going to be so hard. So the first change is that they're not being produced in Nepal. They're being produced in Austin. Because we were like, oh my god, how are we going to do that? There was, this didn't make the news somehow, but there was a gas strike in Nepal for the last four months. Like the country completely shut down. There was no, there was no gas, there was no heat, there were no generators, like people were taking ice bucket baths, like there was no power. Um, and so we were like, hey, this is not going to work. We can't, we can't produce something in that climate. But we're in this fellowship now. And like every week, I have deliverables that I have to show up to class with. So ah, how about this group in Austin? So there's an amazing group in Austin called Open Arms that is a community service project for resettled refugees. And they are trained as seamstresses. They produce stuff for IKEA and other like big names. So they are going to make our diapers. And someday soon, I hope I have a diaper in my hand when I talk about this. They're supposed to be here two days ago, but they're lost in the mail, so I don't have them. Um, but I'm learning a lot about this, right? And I think that a lot of the, um, the flexibility and the creativity and the kind of non-attachment to the outcome lessons that we learned in international development are really applicable in this exercise as well. Um, I think in that, in that lesson, I really have learned that I am an entrepreneur, like a serial entrepreneur. I didn't know that, but I, <laughs> I think anybody who maybe looks at the, at the trajectory of the organization that I have founded and run for the last 12 years would be like, well, that's interesting, Sarah, because every 18 months, you start something new. <laughs> so like, kind of by definition, you are that. And I, I just didn't, I didn't have the language for that. So now I know. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, we're growing really fast, which is wonderful, but I won't pretend this hasn't happened before because it has, and that's another really like, wonky part of this work is that, you know, like we, so we, re we responded to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and that was a big deal. We got a lot of money, and we had a lot of profile raising in that, but then it dipped down, and then it came back up, and then it dipped down. So we're in, we're like, we're in an upswing financially right now. We have a lot of visibility happening, a lot of like rich, famous people, or some, not a lot, a couple, <laughs> like, to, like to talk about us, and that's fun, although I don't know what to do with that either, so I'm learning about that. Um, but you know, today, like I'll just be really honest with you guys, today was a really hard day. Today was one of the hardest days I've had in a really long time. Um, a baby died today, and that sucks when that happens. Truth is, 16,000 kids die every day, every day. We just don't, we don't know about that. And a lot of those kids aren't on my watch, but one of those kids was on my watch today. And that is a crappy day. That's a day where I'm like, why don't I have enough money to change this whole system? You know, why, why did this happen? And especially now that I'm a mother, I look, which I wasn't when I started the organization, but I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old now. And I, I look at those kids in a totally different way than I did at, at kids in general 12 years ago. Because that kid, by the grace of God, right, that kid could have been my kid. Um, 
we've been chasing these three donors in Europe <laughs> who like every three days are like, oh yeah, sure, we're gonna pay for that. Go ahead and get things started. And then three days later, an email will be like, oh, actually, we wanna know a little bit more about this thing or could you write that up a different way? And now actually we want you to work with that partner you've never met before, but we think you're gonna be a really good match in this way that has nothing to do with what we're doing, but I have to talk to them to get the funding to do the thing that we're already doing. <laughs> so today was just one of those days where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to go talk to a group of people tonight about <laughs> this work. <laughs> but on a day like today, I'm just like, why am I not a waitress? That would be like, <laughs> that'd be so great to just go to work be done with work and go home. Um, but also, on a day like today, I feel, and I knew that this would happen after getting in front of you and being with you, that I feel so crazy lucky to do what I do for a living. Because once I was you, and I wanted to do this, and I had no idea the path to get there. Um, I'm from rural Arkansas. My dad's a hick and a hillbilly. <laughs> Um, nobody travels in my family ever, anywhere. Um, they're like, where, who are you? Where did you come from? Um, like I didn't have, I'm married to a doctor. I didn't know any doctors growing up. Um, when I met him, he was just like this skinny hippie who wanted to be a doctor, and now he is. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I feel like there are, there are not a lot of moments in my grown, the grown-up version of my life where I get to see the version of me 20, ah, 20 years ago <laughs> that, that wanted this but didn't know how to do it. And I just, I feel so lucky to get to hang out with you and just be in conversation about how, what can I help you understand about this world you think you might want to work in or this world you think you might want to write about, or this world you think you might want to study. Um, it's incredibly important what we do in international development, and we do it wrong 9,000 times every day. Um, but we do it better than we did 20 years ago. You know, in 20 years from now, we'll do it better than we're doing now. And you're the people who are going to help us figure that out. Um, so now I'm going to be done talking now at you. Um, and I'm very happy to have a conversation with you. <coughs> So does anybody have a question or like, whoa, that was a crazy thing you just said back there. Can you back up a little bit? Yeah. When was the first moment that you realized that you were doing what you wanted to do? Whoa. <laughs> I know that moment. I, I totally know that moment. Are you ready? Yeah. It's not like as clean and tidy as you want it to be. Okay. All right. So um, my last semester in graduate school, I got offered an amazing job. I got offered this job with World Vision. You guys heard about World Vision, like biggest NGO in the world, 92 country offices, 15,000 employees, deep pockets. They get to invest in a community and be there for a really long time. They do, they do good work. Um, they offered me this amazing job in Badakhshan, Afghanistan, like my dream location. I want to work, I still want to work in Badakhshan. My husband will not let me, but I still want to work there. <laughs> it is the place in the world where most moms die. 20% of moms die just by getting pregnant. You die because you're anemic, because you don't have access to a physician who's a man, um, because you're having your babies too close together, because you're having them too young. So World Vision had just gotten a lot of funding to start a series of reproductive health clinics. I was going to make money. I was going to be out of debt. Like I was going to pay off graduate school in like two years. It was going to be great. And then I met this guy. Thankfully, it's my husband, so that story ends well. But <laughs> I remember that, so, my, so this was over Thanksgiving that I got this email from World Vision. They offered me this job, and I was like, but him and the job and that guy and the job. And my mom emailed me, who lives in Austin, and she said, we bought you a house. And I was like, whoa, back up. I didn't ask for a house. You're not the kind of people who can afford a house. What do you mean you bought me a house? They bought me a trailer. They say I come from <laughs> Hicks, right? So. So they bought me a trailer, and, but it was an Airstream, so it was cool, right? <laughs> and, and they're like, we set it up, we put it in this nice pecan grove by the Colorado River, which nobody calls the Colorado, like Lady Bird Lake is not called the Colorado River, it's called Town Lake. Um, but I was like, oh, wow, well, that sounds kind of cool. And they're like, listen, $400 a month, all utilities paid. You can, that organization you want to start, you can come here 
and do that. So essentially, they were like, how do we keep her from going to Afghanistan? <laughs> and they didn't know about the boy, or they probably would have employed that in some, in some way. Um, so I go to Austin, and I found Coe living in this Airstream in Shady Grove trailer park that is now condos on Barton Springs Road. And um, I'm laying on my tiny little couch in my Airstream, and a tsunami had hit um, Southeast Asia the night before. And as I was just watching the death toll, 100,000, 150,000, 200,000, and I was like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. People need to do something. And I was like, wait, I can do something. I run an NGO that does that. All right, let's go. We're doing this. So the internet barely existed. Like you still had to have a cord into the wall. And I don't think I, I had like a cell phone that didn't work really. And um, there was no Facebook or social media to speak of. It was like barely email. And it was New Year's Eve. And we had already sent three people to Sri Lanka. And I'm just by the seat of my pants flying, trying to figure out like how to get in money, how to find the people on the ground doing the thing. Um, NPR called. Woo, NPR. I, I was just like, oh my god, all hot and bothered. And it was New Year's Eve, and this boy, who's now my husband, was with me in the Airstream, and we're emailing. And midnight happened, and we didn't even notice. As we're drinking beer and doing this thing. And he's like, come on, let's go outside. And I remember standing in the driveway, looking up at the sky, being like, I'm poor as shit. I have no idea how I'm going to do any of this. I'm going to keep these people safe. How I'm going to pay them. And this guy, like, I really love him, but I can't tell him that. And, <laughs> but I was doing it. And it was terrifying. But I kind of know that about like 12 years out. I hope I know this by, about me now. I love that spot. I love that spot of being really scared. Not like jumping out of a plane, never going to do that. My sister does that, don't get it. But I love being in those places where I feel like I'm being, I'm being presented with the opportunity to do tremendous good if I can just solve the problem. That was a great question. Thank you for asking me that question. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about, um, like, I know it's kind of the same theme in the different countries, but how is the experience or the situation different for the women in different countries? Um, so it is and it isn't. You know, um, too many women in the world are married too young, start having babies too young don't get to go to school, don't get to finish their educations, they're hungry, they work too hard. And that could be anywhere. I mean, that could be many places in Texas. Um, so when I remember, like, in the beginning, I was really committed to this, oh, every place is different. Like, every place has this cultural re relevancy and their own, their own thing. But if you just, like, scrape off the language or the weather or, like, the oppressive politicians that are doing this, it is it is a lot the same. You know, it is babies too soon, babies too young, not enough education. We know that education is the defining thing. If you can get a girl through high school, you, the, the percentage, the proportion, the, the likelihood that her life, that, that, that extreme poverty will end there is exponentially higher than if she doesn't. Um, I think if there is a part of the world that I have found that is the differentest, from every place else, it's the Middle East, which is just wildly, wildly different than every place we've been, especially in regards to women. Um, there's not a single safe house in the West Bank. Um, the, the, the rates of violence and, um, yeah, yeah, like starting that conversation, we do a lot of work around gender-based violence and sexual assault. and starting those conversations in the Middle East, you have to start way further back. Or to even find an organization to work with there, there are no men's organizations doing that work there. Where in East Africa or different, most parts of Asia or even Latin America now, there are community-based organizations of men. They're not a lot, but they are there, who are organizing themselves um, around stopping violence against women. But in the Middle East, there's none of that. Does that answer your question? Um, 
Is there like any conflict within like the community, like some like anti like medical movement in a way, hmm. like in the like in the developing countries you're working with? Like, cause if like they come like you come out to them with like a vaccine or something, are they weary because it's like different? Than the yeah, also, yeah. I'd say you have to go real deep in to find that. Uh, but the communities in Nicaragua where we work that are really only started interacting with the modern world about eight years ago, there's still a lot of resistance to mainstream yeah. medicine. And what do you think of like the anti-vaccine like, movement in like the U.S.? I think it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say that real loud. Okay. I'm married to a pediatrician. That baby that died, died because it didn't have the vaccines it needed. You know? I have a lot of friends in South Austin who don't vac vaccinate their children. We don't talk about it because, like, that—that's a real, that's a real deal breaker. But uh, yeah, I feel pretty strongly about that. You know, I mean, autism is an awful thing. It's a hard thing to live with, and I don't, you know, but I don't think it has anything to do with vaccines. How do you feel about it? I don't really have like a strong view or anything. Yeah. Because I don't. And I didn't give you very much in evidence in that response. <laughs> um, you know, I think that there, those camps are really far away from each other, the, the anti and the pro vaccine camps. Um, and I would really challenge anybody who thinks that vaccines aren't a good idea to go hang out in a place where polio still happens. And you will change your mind about that. I mean, it's our responsibility. We're the people of privilege, you know? Take a shot. Take an ibuprofen. You'll be fine. Um, and in that, you are going to help keep lots and lots and lots of people who don't have, who either can't take it because they're too sick or don't have the money to get it, you're going to help keep them safe. And quite honestly, that's how we got to 7 billion people or whatever godforsaken number we are now because this did it. Right? It turned the tide on our, on our ability to, to live long, prosperous lives. Now I'm rambling. All right, there was a hand over here. Yeah. Um, you talked briefly about uh, cultural appropriateness. Do you think it's, you can teach more like, uh, profits in or nonprofits here what cultural appropriateness is? Because I know that's a big issue. And you talk about in class a lot. So, for full disclosure, I'm a total racist, which I realized on my first night alone in Africa. Like, we can talk all we want about that, and I just think it's really important to be honest about that, right? Like, sure, I'll talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about cultural appropriateness, biases, all of that stuff, but it's really just talk until we all also say, yeah, I'm really, like, I was told to be afraid of this, or this experience happened to me and made me afraid of this thing. So we have a training that we require all of our field volunteers to go through. Um, and I talk really candidly with them about this. I don't expect them to not make a mistake about it. I make those mistakes all the time. What I ask is that when they make it, they own it, that they don't hurt anybody, um, and that they're, they're as honest as they can be about the experience. I mean, in the work that we do, I mean, let's just call it, like we're a bunch of white people, mostly, in my organization, that go to places where people are not necessarily white, and we provide health care. There's class, privilege, gender, all sorts of layers in that that are, like there's, there's no way to equalize that. It isn't equal. So the best thing we can do is to be honest about what it is. Um, can I tell you a little story about when I got totally called out about this? So I was living in the Middle East and I was contracted by USAID to teach a bunch of, oh, just forgive me for saying this, but this is what the contract read, African nurses on different like things about gender. So they travel to the Middle East because it's cheaper to fly them from Africa to the Middle East than it is to fly like Europeans to Africa to do this training. So level one of sort of like, we could have been kinder about that. Um, so we're on this kibbutz in Israel, me, a bunch of Israelis who live there and like 25 nurses from Tanzania and Kenya, wild just that in and of itself. So I go through like day one of like war and gender and the gendering of war and like the impact that war has on women's bodies and on children and like a full eight hours first day, right? I'm into the second day, I'm like halfway through 
and I'm, it's like lunchtime, and I'm walking out of the room. I'm thinking like I'm doing a good job, right? Like people are asking engaging questions like you guys, and like they're taking notes, and I'm walking out of the room, and one of the participants says, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, yeah, of course. Let's be in conversation. Please talk to me. <laughs> and she's like, you seem like somebody who would appreciate this feedback, so I'm just going to tell you. But I'm going to tell you this is making me nervous right now. I like, just wanted to tell you this. But the way you're depicting African women in your presentation to a room of professional African women is inappropriate. And I was like, oh, oh my god, oh my god. My white liberal, like wanting to help person was just like, it felt so embarrassed. Um, so I was like, oh my god, what do I do with this? I still have them for a day and a half. Like all this stuff is already made, and. Oh yeah, and I had like a three-month-old baby with me, so I had like nursing stuff to do and the baby in the room, and it's like, okay. So they came back in, and I was like, hey, I'm an asshole, and I'm really sorry about that. I'm gonna take the afternoon, and I'm gonna rework all of this based on what you told me, and I hope that you will come back tomorrow and let me try this again. So they did, and I reworked it. Um, but I am acutely aware of that now. But I wouldn't have been if that person hadn't have told me. Like, I would have just sat there in my, like, yeah, look at me. I run an international aid organization. I'm helping these African nurses learn their thing. Like, I wouldn't have known if that woman wouldn't have told me. So, you know, we have to do as much actual listening in this as we can. And that's hard because oftentimes people don't want to actually talk to us. I can't imagine why. But that, you know, they don't. And so we have to do our best to create a place where that conversation can actually happen amongst ourselves as peers in the work and the people that we serve. Anybody else? Yeah. So I have an interest in Israeli Palestinian conflict. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, uh, and I've like read and like watched some videos and like how like that conflict has helped, like, um, not helped, um, affected um, a lot of like Palestinian, more like uh, um, a lot of Palestinian women um, like maternally. Yeah. Like, do you have any like, can you share like a story sure. or something about that? That's probably the part of the work I'm the proudest of is that we helped, we helped, we founded a program called Midwives for Peace between Israeli and Palestinian midwives in 2005. Um, it took two years to get them in the same room. It was not an easy thing to do. Not because they weren't like, yeah, totally, I want to hang out. It was that we couldn't get the Palestinians into Israel because we would get like to the last step of getting their travel papers set and then the government would pivot and we'd have to start all over again. Um, and the Israelis, to go into the West Bank, that's an act of civil disobedience for them to cross the border. Um, and while they were really invested in the, pro the program and the partnership, they weren't that invested at that point. They've now gone over and they've worked through that. But to get them in the same room, we had to find sort of neutral territory and we had to get the paperwork, which took a really long time. But it was amazing when it finally happened. Um, and wow, 9, 10, 11, 11 years later. Um, that program is totally self-directed. It's grown from 10 participants to over 100. They meet quarterly, if they can, um, in this place, this really special place called Beit Jala, which really is like nobody owns it. There's a Lutheran church there, and anybody can get there. It's like, I don't understand it. Nobody really does, <laughs> but you don't have to have papers, and you can go there. Um, so that's where a lot of the coexistence stuff happens. Um, and what, the reason for the program is because we were hearing from the Israelis and we were hearing from the Palestinians that well, they, really just, they really just wanted to know each other. You know, they, sure, they were interested in like neonatal resuscitation and learning this thing about this other thing, but all of, all of the professional development that happened was really just the medium to get them together. Um, so we helped establish the first freestanding birth center in the West Bank, which sadly closed, but it was there for a while. They, these anarchist Palestinian midwives still go there, and they work, but they don't get paid. And that's like just a testament to how committed they are to this. And the midwives support them, the Israeli midwives. They bring them 
Like that, that birth center is stocked from equipment that they brought over from their own practices in Israel to give to the birth center in the West Bank. Um, there's this funny thing happening in there, funny, not really funny, not ha-ha funny, um, that everybody's just trying to kind of outpopulate each other. So the Hasidic Jews are having a ton of babies, and the very religious Arab women are having a ton of babies. And if you talk to them, they will often say, you know, well, we have to, we have to, our numbers need to be greater than their numbers. Now, the Israelis have access to pretty great medical care. I had my first kid there, pretty solid medical care. Palestinians, not such great access to health care. It's not because they aren't really well trained, um, which is um, one of the first biases I had to own that I had about that population that I was just floored with. I mean, they don't get a lot of their education there, so they leave for their education. So Palestinians generally are incredibly well educated. They speak lots of different languages, and they really value education because it's something that's denied them. Um, but they don't have great health care. Um, the hospitals that do exist are solid and staffed by really, really smart people. Um, I think it's 150,000 medical visas are issued every year by Israel for Palestinians to come get health care because the infrastructure for the health care doesn't exist inside the West Bank. Um, so that's actually a new project we're hoping to launch in the next couple of years is a, is a program to train Palestinian physicians um, as, as peace building work um, because there is all of this concern about all these Palestinians coming to Israel for medical care. I don't feel like I answered your question. Did I answer your question? Kind I just rambled. Just um, I just talked about yeah. me. <laughs> like, do you have like, do you know any like, like stories about like the conflict affecting um, like Palestine, like how it affects the Palestinian women like and their maternal health? Sure. Um, so, a lot of these clinics that exist on the Palestinian side of the wall don't have emergency care, right? So. Um, there are a lot of obstructed labors, labors that go too long that could have had a different outcome if they had had access to emergency care, emergency C-sections, forceps, vacuums, those sorts of things. There's not a lot of family planning in the West Bank, um, so you have babies being born too often to people who are too young, um, and that has the, the most common way that that presents clinically is through anemia and postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and there's just this really, this really outrageous um, incidence of violence against women in that part of the country. Um, and I was working with a physician in Gaza um, to do an assessment to determine the rates, did the rates increase as the pregnancies increased, and we learned that they increased a lot. That in his cohort, in his private practice, 95% um, of the women in their last trimester were being beat weekly by their husbands. And that was 10 years ago when the violence there wasn't nearly, like when, the, when people had a lot more access to water and food in Gaza. Now it's just, when you hear like open air prison, that's a, quite, that's a pretty literal description of the place. Totally uplifting. Anybody else have like an like a uplifting <laughs> question? Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I'm the worst American. I speak only English, so I deal with it with a lot of frustration. Um, if you want a career in international development, learn Arabic, Mandarin, or Hindi. You will have a job <laughs> forever. Um, and just learn a language. I didn't. Um, really, really important. So I have translators. Um, and the places that we go to over and over again, we have We've developed relationships with translators. We have this amazing team of translators, translators in Haiti um, that we have developed over the last six years, and they are amazing. I had a really bad translator on my last trip to Nicaragua. And whew, man, that sucked. Um, so I guess the answer is with as much grace as I can muster, given that I'm a stupid American and only speak one language. Learn a language. Yeah. Um, why did you decide, like, I guess this was like, you know, while you were in grad school, why did you decide international development rather than like, you know, this sort of aid work like within the U.S.? Like, why did you decide to go international? Um, I think 
because I had been everywhere in America. My parents said, we, like, we didn't travel to internationally, but by the time I graduated from high school, I had been to every state in the United States. And we did a lot of driving. And I love traveling. And it's a pretty selfish way to get around the world and to see stuff. Um, so that's probably part of it. Um, Second was probably that I didn't feel that the poverty and inequity in America was as severe as other places um, and really wanted to be like where it was the hardest. Um, why do you want to do international development? I, I don't want to do international <laughs> development. <laughs> ah, all right. Because, yeah, I studied abroad in Namibia. Ah. Um, so like I definitely we and I took like development classes there and just like and, like it is so easy to screw it up. Boy, isn't it? So I just like it's a little bit safer, but still in the U.S. It's like, not. Like though. know the communities it's rather than safer. pretend I know that the communities. It's not. That's the thing. Like I thought when I came back and worked in English, right? Where oh it was here. It was in Austin when we were trying to found this trafficking clinic. I was like, oh this would be a piece of cake after all this other crazy hard stuff we've done. Oh my God, that was so not easy. It was it was the same level of misunderstanding, even though everybody's speaking English. <laughs> um, the same level of ego, everybody needing their name on a thing. Um, all kinds of other kinds of bureaucracy that at least like I understood because I know like Seton and community care, but um, I, I want to check back in with you in 10 years and see what you found about that because my experience has not supported that theory. So good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Could you speak as candidly as you did about the perspectives of how you feel about uh, abstinence only? Oh, geez. Are you setting me up? <laughs> I'm in Texas. It's, it's not a plan of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to just drink some water. It's really bad in South Texas, especially in this community. So I was wondering if you could uh, address, and I know a lot of our students, there are classes that talk about those types of things. Okay. So if you could kind of, kind of localize it. Okay. Um, so it's pretty messed up. Um, oh, well. All right. Um, so, how many of you are from Texas? Whoa, that's so shocking. Wow, cool, okay. So you're familiar with the super liberal landscape that we live in in the state of Texas. Um, here's the thing, like, do you know that Roe v. Wade was fought in Texas? Do you know that the attorney who defended, who, who defended that case is from Austin? And Roe was from South Texas. Anybody know that? All right, I'm teaching a little bit of history to some of you. It's good. All right. So that's kind of like one of the crazy things about this state is that we have a history of sort of setting the trend, yet we are so very far behind it in this state. I think absence only is just, it's reckless and it's dangerous, and that's how people end up dead and end up pregnant. And, um, it doesn't foster a culture of, of joy, quite honestly. Sex is awesome. It is awesome. You should have it frequently with people that you feel safe with. And imagine if that is how we were all taught about sex, right? We would have such a different, a different approach. Additionally, this might blow your mind a little bit, that sex is mostly for pleasure. Right? You're only going to have only the heterosexual people in the world, which we are not all, right? we are a portion of, are going to have sex to make babies for a very small portion of our lives. So why do we focus so much on that and not more on the it's awesome, have it, be safe, and respectful conversation? Um, we're really afraid of it, which sucks for most of us. That That's the way we go about it. Um, yeah. Abstinence is not the way to go. I had to, I had to sign a contract once to teach abstinence when I was working in Vietnam doing this HIV ed, AIDS education, and that was soul crushing, man. That was so hard. Um, also had to, on that contract, even though I was there to work with sex workers on my contract, said I wouldn't work with sex workers 
um, that I wouldn't give out condoms, that I wouldn't talk about um, clean needle exchange, but I was there to do HIV AIDS education. So like, how in the world are we supposed to succeed in doing this? And I think the clinicians of the world need to kind of rise up in this one because I think that especially physicians, we, they take an oath, right? Like, do no harm. You said you are going to not harm people. You need to tell the truth, and you need to be really active and vocal about the parts of the public health education that we're feeding our kids that just are, it's dangerous. Um, so there, was that candid enough for you? <laughs> In your organization. I know Today? Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, organization. Just kind of like over the okay. I got the low. I got the low. Let's think about the high. I know. I make you talk about bad things. No, it's important. It's so important. I'm, I love the opportunity to disclose the dark stuff. It's important. Um, so the lowest low was when our trainer in Tibet got arrested for being a spy by the Chinese government. That sucked. And then we spent two years negotiating with Amnesty International to get him released from prison. How long? Two years. That sucked. Can you just leave that one more behind? Yeah. I know, right? So we had this amazing Tibetan trainer. We always work with national trainers. Um, and he was arrested by the Chinese government for being a spy and was in prison for two years. And we had to work with Amnesty International to get him out. We got wind of it and we got his family out um, before they could arrest his wife and his kid. Um, so that happened. But you know, I think actually worse than that, one of our field volunteers was raped in Tanzania. She didn't tell me until she'd been back for like a year. But girls, shit's real. And you take yourself some self-defense classes before you go out there and it is a requirement at our organization for all of the field volunteers. Um, that is a very real byproduct of this work. In fact, there's a, there's a book being written collectively by women in this field um, about that, finally, um, how many of us are assaulted and attacked in the field. So that's the lows. Highs. Julianne Moore came to my fundraiser in November. That was pretty cool. She's really tiny. <laughs> um, the Pope called the clinic in McAllen. That was cool. That's never going to happen ever again. That Monday is never happening in my life again. <laughs> Not a wrong number. He meant to do that. Um, You know, truthfully, probably it was like the first baby I delivered in the field. I, rem I mean, that is like so long ago, it feels very far away. But that was another one of those moments when I was like, oh my God, I'm doing that thing. You feel like that I, you yeah, know. that I, I said I was going to do this with my life, and oh my God, I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> moments. Where were you? Um, that baby was in Sri Lanka. Well, with Koei, the first baby that I delivered with the organization. Little boy. First baby for that mom. She did a great job. Super quick. In spite of our documentary film crew that was in the room. <laughs> yeah. I heard a rumor um, that you were swimming. Oh, geez. I am <laughs> swimming. Can you elaborate why you Sure. So I'm swimming from Turkey to Greece um, on Mother's Day, which is in 42 days. <laughs> just happened to know that, <laughs> not counting or anything. Um, and I'm, I mean, we're doing it as part of a fundraiser. Like it's, you know, there's, there's a larger campaign behind it. Um, but the idea really came from, you know, when people ask me, like, what do you identify as? First, I'm a mom, for sure. Um, and second, I'm an activist. Like all this other, like a, that I'm a manager and a fundraiser and quite honestly a wife, like all that was not really part of what I saw was like going to definitely be part of my life. Mother and activism. And I write a lot of email 
and I do a lot of this, and I don't feel like I do enough action. And um, this is a political action. And it is, in many regards, sort of an act of civil disobedience. It's against the law. You know, we're going to be swimming through like boat channels, and NATO is going to be there apparently, and you know, that will be what that is. But uh, hopefully, it won't be too hostile. Um, I just, I needed to do something. I mean, I imagine some of you feel a similar sense of that. Like, the news is so overwhelming. And um, I often think about this work and talk about it in aggregate, right? Like, big numbers. 80% of the world's refugees are women and children. 16,000 babies are going to die today, right? Like, these big numbers. Um, but I sometimes just need to break that down into something that's a little more tangible. And so we have two campaigns a year now. Um, one we do in the fall that's called In Her Shoes, that's a nutritional campaign. And we invite people to replicate the diet of one of the women that we care for. So we have 16 different profiles of 16 different women that we've cared for. You can choose a Sri Lankan diet or one of the women in the Rio Grande Valley. And the intention is to for us to hold them in our mind and our heart for some extended period of time, right? Um, and so I've been training now for two months. I'm up to two miles a day. Um, I need to be doing three miles a day by the end of April. And I swear to God, I think about these women. You know, like the other day I got in this pool that was so friggin' cold and I did not want to be in that water. And whiny, privileged, South Austin Sarah was like, ugh, just, nobody knows. I can just get out of here. And I just tell people I did this. Nobody's watching. And I was like, what am I doing? She doesn't get to get out of the boat. Get back, like, swim. Get in the pool and swim. And for me, it is really providing this way to connect with the work that I haven't in a long time. It's remarkably re emotional. And you know, I'm going to get on a plane, I'm going to fly to Turkey, I'm going to get on a bus, I'm going to go to the beach, I'm going to look across the water, I'm going to get in it, I'm going to swim across it, I'm going to get out. Like, I can't imagine the level of emotion I'm going to feel about that. And I just, I need, I need to do something bigger than, like, organizing shipments of birth kits and writing grants. So that's why. It's not so far. Um, it's the long, we, ha we have three different routes that we're considering based on weather and boat traffic. The longest is 6.6 um, .6 miles, and the shortest is 1.5. Yeah. And are they going to agree to film while you swim on diet? <laughs> Lucky me. Yes. <laughs> yes, I will be. Will it be live stream? I don't know. We're working on it. Um, you know, as it is, we had like a super grand vision that Diana Nyad and Michael Phelps would be there with me and we would be <laughs> doing this thing, right? Um, Michael Phelps said no. He's busy training for the Olympics. Um, <laughs> Diana Nyad, I don't know if you guys know who she is. She's just like this friggin' amazing marathon swimmer. You should read her book um, that just came out. I think it's called, oh, what's it called? Finding a, find a Way find the way or something like that. She has a tremendously like, inspiring life story. And she swam from Cuba to the United States. So that was her like, big thing that she did. Um, so she only swims for charity now. We're trying to. But she's not answering her Instagram. Like, we're trying to get her attention. She's not answering. Um, yeah, all of you. Get, help me get Diana and I's attention. Um, so we do have one Olympic marathon swimmer swimming with us. Her name is Michelle Macy. Um, she's going to make me look real bad. She's going to be real fast. I'm going to be like, uh -oh. um, And we have some celebrities who may want to be going with us. And we're trying to figure out if that's appropriate, what we think about that, how much money they're going to bring along. So maybe it doesn't matter if it's appropriate, because it'll pay for the work. <laughs> the reality about international development. Um, so, and then there's some media that may or may not cover it. So CBS Sports has a women's show, I guess, that 
Um, Dana Torres, who's another female swimmer, um, and Muhammad Ali's daughter. Um, that's awful. I should know that woman's name. She's like a, yeah, that that's her, Layla, woman in her own right, not just her father's daughter. Um, that they co-host, so they're thinking about joining us. Or no money will be raised. I will be at Barton Springs, and we'll just try again next year. So. You know, we, uh, we have a lot of money to raise for this. It's a really, it's about five grand a swimmer. So we have to raise enough money for it to be worth spending that. Um, and we're not there today, which is another reason today was not such a fabulous day, until all of you were there. Yeah. So how large are your hospitals? And um, how many do you have? So we don't have any hospitals. We work through community-based allies. So. The hospitals that we've worked in, I'd say the biggest one, we worked in um, Red Crescent Hospital, which is in East Jerusalem. I think it's about a 250-bed hospital. But we only worked in the labor and delivery section of them. So we were supporting the midwives and the NICU, the neonatal section. So there's no like uh, uh, building the hospital, like building uh, So we have built some birth centers. Um, we've never built a hospital. That is a major, major undertaking that we don't have. I don't know how to build a hospital. Of course, I didn't know how to like make cloth diapers, and now I know how to do that. So <laughs> maybe yeah, we'll start doing. Uh, probably the wrong term for that. Just kind of like a clinic? Right, yeah. Um, so the only clinic that we have been a part of building from the ground up is the maternity clinic in Haiti, okay. um, because the hospital that was there was decimated during the earthquake. And women were just having babies in the road and in the field. So we helped to raise the funds to build this building. It has um, a surgery center. It has a NICU with three beds. It has a delivery room with two beds. And it has a recovery area with eight beds. Um, I've only seen it full to capacity a couple times. Um, but we have heard that the care there now is so good and the reputation of it is so good that women are coming from Port-au-Prince to have their babies there, which really tells you how awful that maternity hospital in Port-au-Prince is because that's like Dante's seventh layer of hell right there. That's another place you do not ever want to find yourselves, I'm people. I'm <laughs> Stay far away from the city hospitals in Port-au-Prince. Okay. Where are you going? Oh, um, I'm not exactly sure where in Haiti yet, um, but it's for a mission trip. Cool. Um, cool. Well, it'll be interesting to see what you think about international development after that trip. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Could you give us, like, we talk a lot about, like, these grand ideas, but we don't, like, what do you do every day? Like, what do you get up and do? Well, right now I get up and I swim a lot. <laughs> um, I am trying really, so for years I had no like rhyme or reason to my day, right? Like my day just took me and that was not efficient management or efficient work. Um, and then I had children and I had to get really efficient with my time. So I have my week, to, unless we're in a disaster mode um, or disaster response mode, the, my, my days are broken out. So Monday are administrative days because I hate that and I will not do it if I don't have to, so I put it at the beginning of my week, and I don't get to get to the fun stuff until I fill in the stuff that I have to fill in. So that's Mondays, and the staff meetings are Mondays. Tuesdays are relationship days, so I manage a lot of um, relationships with community-based partners, academic partners. So Tuesdays are people I need to check in with, days. Um, Wednesdays are diaper days. Diaper Wednesday. Um, I, I try to not get sucked into my email on Wednesdays. And I go into my Wednesday with a pretty long to-do list of all of the operation parts of the social enterprise work that we're doing right now. Um, Thursdays are program proposal days. So any kind of proposals or fundraising pieces that I need to get going. Um, and then Fridays are our gratitude days, and we say thank you a lot on Fridays. We have a very dedicated organizational practice around gratitude. We write handwritten thank you cards, we call people, we say thank you. Um, 
We have a 15-minute meeting at the beginning of the week and a 15-minute meeting, meeting at the end of the week with what are your priorities for the week, anything time sensitive, and then at the end, did you get to those things? And we've got two hours left in the workday. What can we help you get through so you get there? Um, of course, all of that is often derailed by things that happen. Um, but um, I'm really easily distracted by the shiny things, and so I have to keep myself on that track. bring in money, um, the appropriateness of anything like that. Have you ever had to turn down the funding because of the appropriateness? Yeah, because I was an idiot. I was <laughs> such an idiot. Um, so in this Sri Lanka response that happened, that was our first big disaster response, um, one of my donors called and was like, all right, I got a $5,000 donation for you. And I was like, um, I'm going to say no. And she was like, what? And I was like, but here's the thing, like we're kind of done. Like we, all the midwives, all our volunteers are home. We've given out cash grants to all of our local partners. We've distributed all the stuff. Like if someone gives me $5,000 more and they're expecting it to be spent here, I don't have a way to spend it. So tell them to keep it. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.